Welcome everyone to the last of the Sociological Review Summer Sessions, which um, if you haven't caught previous ones, have explored behind the scenes of the journal to look at some of the aims and practices. I'm Christine Payton. I'm a senior lecturer in the sociology of class at the University of Glasgow, and I'm also general editor at the Sociological Review. And along with a fellow editor, Karen Throsby, who's the director of the Centre for Interdisciplinary and Gender Studies, SIGS, at the School of Sociology and Social Policy at the University of Leeds. Uh, we're going to explore today the thing that we all love the most probably about publishing, and that is receiving and responding to peer wow. review feedback. Now, one of the promotional tweets for this event mentioned Reviewer2, who's become somewhat of a feared bogeyman or, or woman who gives devastating, brutal feedback. Uh, and in this session, we want to go beyond that idea and think about the intellectual value of peer review and the supportive aspects of this process. Also, I saw um, TSR Twitter account retweeted uh, a tweet the other week that said, academia's love language is feedback. Now, I hope by the end of the session, I'm not sure, no, I don't know if I will convince you of that, but we'll show that side of the process by shedding light on some of the practices here at the Sociological Review. Most of us have experienced this process uh, as an author or maybe about to, if you're an early career researcher. We know far less about what goes on in the kind of mechanics of the review process and particularly the role of the editor and guiding that review process. And we think this will be particularly fruitful in, in helping us understand that process. So to do this, we'll draw upon the perspectives of both an author and an editor to use a single paper as a case study. And to help us with that, uh, we have here today a TSR journal author, Balaji Balagan, who is a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the Department of Geography at the University of Sheffield and Michael Benson, who's Professor in Public Sociology at Lancaster University, Chief Executive of the Sociological Review Foundation, but also our former Editor-in-Chief and long-serving editor, so knows a lot about this process. So thank you very much for joining us. I'll hand over to Karen. Great, thanks, Kirstine. Yeah, just a little bit of sort of housekeeping before we start, so you know how the session's um, going to run. We've got about an hour, and um, the four of us are going to talk um, sort of a bit of Q&A for about 40 minutes and then there'll be 20 minutes left for questions from from the other participants. Um, we have set everybody's mic to be off and that's just to sort of avoid background noise um, and so on. Um, but if you've got a question, please do um, type it into the chat and we'll come back and, and, um, and go through them um, when it comes to the Q&A time. So even if it's a question you think of so while we're in mid conversation, just put it in the chat. Um, so if you you know if you don't want to forget, that's absolutely fine. We are recording this session just so everybody's um, aware of that, and this will be made public um, so relatively soon after um, the session is finished. You've probably seen some of the others already um, circulating. I know we've got a really international audience today. I saw the number of the people who'd registered, so welcome everyone uh, from everywhere. Um, and I think with that, we'll start. Um, so I'm going to start with um, a question, uh, a few questions with um, Balaji first, um, so we can learn a bit more about the paper that, um, and the process there. So Balaji, could you tell us just a little bit about the paper itself? You know, what is it? And, um, and also, why did you submit it to the Sociological Review? Well, thanks very much for that, uh, for those questions, uh, Karen. First of all, well, thanks to Sociological Review for the invitation uh, to discuss uh, the processes that I actually went through uh, when I submitted my, my paper. It was, it was quite interesting uh, with, uh, with Michaela, and also thanks to everyone for joining the, uh, this, the discussion. So the paper that we're actually talking about uh, is titled uh, Race and Racism in Poland, uh, theorizing and contextualizing Polish centrism. So it, it's just some sort of an attempt to theorize race and racialization uh, in Poland. So in the paper, I try to examine uh, what it means to be black and be Polish at the same time. And also what it, does it really mean to be black in the Polish uh, society? 
But beyond those, you know, engagements, I try to engage with the fundamental underpinnings of, you know, race in, in Central and Eastern Europe, because quite often we do get, I mean, especially now uh, with what's actually been going on, we can see example with the war in Ukraine, we do get now some sort of empirical materials about, you know, the ways in which people of color, especially black people, are being you know, racialized in, in Central and Eastern Europe. But I thought I could go beyond just, you know, those empirical materials by looking at the underpinning, you know, uh, of race in, in Central and Eastern Europe by looking at things like, you know, eugenics, you know, in what ways did eugenics actually shape the understanding or the identification of people, you know, around Central and Eastern Europe. So this is what the paper actually, what it, it's, um, right. it, it's focused on. But prior to that, uh, my paper in um, in uh, sociological review. I already had two papers published in the Journal of Ethnic and Racial Studies, um, and all this paper, including one uh, in in, uh, in sociological review, they were actually published at a different time during my PhD uh, research. So it was quite a very very interesting stage when I needed a lot of support. You know, sure. to get through many, uh, many of these things. So, to your second question, uh, Karen, um, why sociological review? Of course, I mean, as a sociologist, it's no brainer not to publish a sociological review. <laughs> and there are quite a few things that also that shaped my my trajectory uh, towards sociological review. Uh, one of those things is being um, I've been so lucky to be mentored by you know very good scholars uh, that actually work within sociology, you know, somebody like he and law, bless him, that's just passed on. Uh, I've got, I had Bobby Said as uh, also my uh, supervisor. So these are the people that have already really published at a very high level. And quite often, I, I remember almost every time when I have my supervision, it's always shoving down your throat. You have to publish at the top level. You cannot go down, you know, any route. And sociological review quite often comes up in my conversation. Like it has to be this, it has to be that. It cannot be anything less than this group of top um, uh, uh, journals. And another thing that really shaped that is I thought about the area that I'm actually working in. It's quite unique and very niche. Looking at race in Central and Eastern Europe, and I mean, in my view, people who often say that I adopt a very modest you know, approach to this. You know, it's it, it's, it's not that it's not been done before. It's been done. There are so many materials out there. But my understanding is where these materials are, they are not really getting enough you know, publicity or the support or the platform where they should be in order to bring the debate out a lot more. And I, when I had this paper, you know, when I started writing, thinking about where to actually place this paper, one of the things that came up with was that there was no point in me putting this paper anywhere where it would not be well circulated. So it was almost going to be like making the same mistake that you know has been done before. We need this debate to get out there and for the debate to be well circulated. It has to be a well circulated and well expedited paper. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really right with that because since the publication of this paper, I think it was 2020, you know, it's been well circulated. I mean, sociological review has to make it available for people to download, you know, freely, you know, at different stages when I was actually doing my, my PhD. So, um, yeah, apart from going for, of course, another top journal, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, having a very well circulated, well established, you know, um, journal, it's, it's really, really, really important because there's no point. You know, what contribution are you going to be making? And I mean, looking at logical review as well, I mean, I, I identify a, a bit of gap. I mean, me and my, myself and Michaela, we always talk about this. And she's always said, you, you have a way of identifying this gap and you just plunk your argument into it. I mean, I look at the debate in logical review and I thought, you know what, you know, Central and Eastern Europe itself has been overlooked in this debate. So I thought it would be good to actually, you know, Add that aspect of you know that you know, areas of understanding of race from that part of region of the world that's often you know seen as detached and non-complicit and not mm -hmm. involved in the yeah. global understanding of race. And I thought it would be good to bring that into the focus and into the fore. And I think Sociological Review really offered me that kind of opportunity, and it was it was really really brilliant. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And I think it's really useful advice for kind of when people are trying to pick a journal. I mean, not just this journal, but, you know, think about where it might belong. 
where it might do well. Um, great. So I guess the next question is you've submitted your you've submitted your article to the to the sociological review. So there's two questions that come from this. What kind of um, response were you sort of expecting when, uh, when you submitted it sort of from the feedback? And then and then what what response did you receive and how did you feel about the feedback that you got? I, I really like the first question. Um, I, I, in terms of the kind of responses that actually I received, they don't quite, um, I mean, what I was expecting to start with, I, I wasn't really expecting anything. You know, I, I often try to have a very open mind about my work. You know, I, I'm always cautious about my expectations as well, because when I mean, come to think about it, this work is only just being probably be done by myself is gonna end up being looked at by maybe another four or three people. No, they're, they're gonna have their own views on it. And at the end of the day, this paper will never be the same from the beginning until, until the end. So I often have a very, very open mind. And because also, again, I mentioned before uh, that this is a very niche area of study and it's really, really difficult to even draw a very interesting, really precise you know, point of, references but when it comes to you know discussing uh, of uh, race and racialization in central and eastern europe so for that i often quite you know expect really very broad you know comments you know but one thing that i do get and i have to really put that here is there's always positive comment about this is new you know and i mean for example i think i had three reviewers and across the board the, the comment that three of them started with was like wow okay this is new to what we are already with what we knew and this is really contributing interesting things to what we're going to be doing and then on top of that we had the criticism how can we shape this paper to become something really better and that really helped me to look at this that it's not always positive you know for anyone who's thinking about you know sending that paper out there you have to sort of have a very very open mind about many of these things that well of course Rivera too we're going to mention that in the end they were, I mean it is I mean, even thinking about Rivera too. If the criticism is not come from Rivera too, it's going to come from somebody else anyway at some point. So having that kind of very very you know broad church mind, it, it's it's really really helped me to you know to accept whatever they, they've asked me uh, uh, to do. In terms of what I actually received. Now, there is a small backstory to this, and uh, I'll, I'll be as brief <laughs> as possible with, with this story. So when I submitted this paper, I think it was back in 2028, towards the end of that 2028. Um, so there was a conference, I think it was the European Surgical Association Conference in Manchester. So I was attending the conference, and I thought there was also, I think there was um a keynote by Gominda Brabrow. So oh, I had to go and listen to Gominda. You no, know, it would be brilliant. So I went in there to listen to listen to Gominda. And then after the you know, uh, keynotes, and then I went to say hello to Gominda, and then we say hello to And then for some reason I started talking to Michaela. Right. Before that point, I didn't know Michaela at all. You know, I know she you know, gave a bit of paper uh, uh, at the same conference. Um, and then we started talking. And then we ended up talking for almost 45 minutes, you know, from one venue to, 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 to another. And then I knew she was actually from Surgical Review, but I didn't know that she was actually the, the editor in charge of my paper. So <laughs> I was thinking, oh my God, don't mention my paper, please. Don't, don't even think about my paper. So at the, anyway, at the end of our conversation, then Michaela just said, well, okay then, Balaji, about your paper. I was like, oh God, what are you doing to me, woman? No, please don't. Anyway, to cut the old story short, it was really good that she actually brought that up because, you know, I found out that from the conversation we actually had, it was quite, you know, constructive and very, very helpful in me going back to look at my paper in order to respond to the reviewers. That was really, really interesting. And it, 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 was, it was quite a welcoming you know, approach, even though I didn't really want to really approach um, uh, Michaela for uh, any of this conversation. But the way she started the conversation, the way she actually worked with it. And also, when I remember when uh, one of the comments actually came back, you know, the way 
she sets out. And when you do get comments back from reviewers, they're always like, almost everywhere. You know, you you are you you're, you're dealing with thinkings of three different people. It's never going to be easy for you to put everything into into context. But there was something that I really really appreciated that Michaela actually did. It was actually just put everything into like I think about five points and about two lines each. Like okay, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and then think about. You know, and there was something that she actually mentioned that probably <laughs> she didn't take note of that. She said, you know, but like you, many of the things that you mentioned here, yeah, they're all about eugenics, you know, and I thought, hang on, I've got piles of documents, you know, historical document about eugenics in Central and Eastern Europe. Why is it that I didn't include this as a section, you know, in this paper? And then I went back to look at the paper again, try to rework everything, you know, into, in, into that paper, especially that section on eugenics is really quite a lot of attention. And interestingly, I mean, this paper was actually published in 2020. That particular aspect that Michaela mentioned in the paper is now the focus, in fact, a broader focus of my current research in Sheffield. So yeah, the, 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 the feedback was actually something very, very interesting. That's amazing. So I guess we can see that you're often, as you say, you're often going to get lots of different feedback from three people, lots of different things coming through. And one of the things that the editor might do in their feet in there when they send the feedback to you is kind of help you to this is obviously what uh, Mikola did help you to prioritize, um, you know, to work your way through the feedback. So perhaps this is a good opportunity for us to go over to Mikola now and get get some of her perspective on this process. Yeah, yeah so Michaela, if, oh sorry. Oh sorry, I just yeah, I want to draw that out specifically from you, um, if you could tell us more about Bob's paper from your perspective, and then what happens, but more specifically when an author then submits a paper for review in a more general sense as well. Yeah, I think Balaji's just gone through really, really clearly um what that process was like from his perspective. And I think that one of the things I really want to highlight here is that. It can be a bit challenging when you get something that's so new um, and that's quite novel and, and, and works on a topic in somewhere in the world that you're not so familiar with or where there isn't such a large body of literature. So this was a really, really ambitious paper. And obviously this was a paper that Balaji had submitted when he was quite early on in his career. And it happened to come at a time where one of the things I'd been doing as editor in chief was really trying to substantially develop the body of work in the journal that focused on questions of race and racism. So I received this paper and it really stood out to me because of its originality and its potential. But I also knew that I would have to pick my reviewers really, really carefully in order to help to deliver that um, potential there. So I wanted to think, I mean, I, I don't want to use the word niche because it's not. This is a paper that has a lot of value for thinking about the kind of the comparative dimensions of work on race and racism. Um, but that also comes with like thinking, OK, so is it appropriate then that you get um, scholars who work on these questions in the US or in Western Europe to do the review on this or other different issues that are ongoing there that they might not be so familiar with um, do I need to get an area specialist and these are always mm -hmm. the things that go through my head when I'm reading a paper and making a decision about who to send it out to review for and in the end I, I did get a set of three reviewers who could cut across um, the work that was in the paper in various different ways and, and that's probably also one of the explanations as to why you get quite different feedback from different reviewers because they come with their own specialisms to do that. But the other factor that plays into this is that as an editor, you're always wanting to offer a supportive experience to an author um, while also helping to develop those strengths around the paper. And this paper with, um, that Balaji submitted, actually it went through a rather unusual process because it came in, it went out to review. It took a really long time to get the first round of reviews. Then it went back to Balaji for, um, for some work. He sent me back um, a version of it um, and I decided that it possibly needed a little bit more work because perhaps my editor's comments at that stage hadn't been as clear as they needed to be to help to direct him through it. 
And so I'd, I'd sent it back to him with a longer explanatory letter saying, I don't want to send this back to the reviewers yet because I'm concerned that they might think um, that, that this hasn't been as addressed as fully as it should do. But if you do these things, then I will happily send it back out. It then went out for a second round of reviews. And I, I think it was somewhere between the first review and the second review that we serendipitously bumped into one another in Manchester at the conference. Um, and from my point of view, just to give my human side of the story here, I was thinking to myself, oh, this poor, poor person, they've had to deal with me as an editor. They don't know it's me because the sociological review system doesn't identify who the editor is dealing with your paper, partly because sometimes papers do have to be switched between editors because of mm. demands on their lives. Um, and I was feeling a bit like, oh, you know, I've asked him to do so much work on this paper. He's really not going to be very, very happy. But actually, we'd, we'd had a conversation that was about the keynotes um, that showed me that he was, he was very, very open. And he happened to mention, I think, that he'd sent this paper to the Sociological Review. And so I did come clean and I was like, yes, it was me. <laughs> um, so, I mean, as I said, this is a slightly unusual process. I've done this previously as well with ECRs when I think that they need a little bit more help with responding to reviewers after they've sent back a revised version. But I think that the other thing to say is I almost always send papers out to review for a second time. And I know that there are people who are worried that this is editors not doing their work properly. But actually, from my point of view, the purpose of peer review is to build a community of practice and support around academic writing. And I think that particularly when reviewers have raised really, really incisive, important um, points about a paper, I want to see, I'm sorry, when reviewers have done that, I want to see that they are content that the author has, has responded to their review in the way that they hoped that they would but also to bring them along so they can see what happens to a paper after they provide the review, because, you know, it's kind of be a bit like, you know, submitting your review and then not learning anything, you know, not learning anything about the outcome at the end of the day. So I think that's really, really important. I should also say there are some very particular things about the peer review process at Sociological Review that's not common across all journals. We do still operate a blind peer review process, which is just one approach to peer review, but we've done that for, for a very long period of time. Um, but there are other approaches that other journals are operating. Nicola, that's really helpful. I, I really just don't think that many people get to see that side of it and how the editor manages that and um, I think that you, you kind of pulled out some of those kind of key aspects around the work that that we all do as editors in sociological review in that managing the reviews and being that bridge between um, the, the reviewers and the author to facilitate because we're <laughs> we are um, we're not kind of playing aside right we're, we're all there for the kind of ultimate goal of the, the article being published you know and that's our kind of that's our you know, our role to facilitate that so it was really helpful to see a bit more about how you kind of draw that out Karen can I pass over to to you yeah yeah so let's go back to to Balaji now and um so you've got your so your second set of reviews, that second review that, that Mikola sent where you've got, you know, a very clear list of things that you that um, she was recommending that you do. You've also got still got the, the feedback from the first round of review. How did you how did you then go about responding to that to that feedback? Right. So at, at that point, so what I did, um, I mean, I, I, I do this across the board with all my, my papers. Um, so first I had a very passive read of the comments, not thinking too much about it, just, just read as if I'm just reading a letter or anything, you know. And when I when I do that, actually, uh, I try to, you know, measure the amount of work that is actually required here. At the same time, I mean, I, I use this word, like, so try to store the information, you know, just put it in my head and just carry it about for a couple of days. So after that, passive read I just left everything for a couple of days so whenever I, maybe I went to the shop or I went to just for work 
that really allows me to build the argument in my head. Okay, there are some things I've been mentioning in this paper. I think I could do it this way. I could do it that way. And for me, I often, you know, it's not enough to just go and, you know, look for the materials to actually work on or to, you know, go and get some of the references that's actually required. It's also about finding um, the thinking time. You know, it, it's really, really important for me because, I mean, the research is already there, you've got all different, but how do you think this thing through? How do you really move it from that very fluid, you know, idea of thinking into very, you know, solid, you know, work? And that thinking time allows me to do this. So when I did the post-passive reading on everything, so I, I really took my time to go about, you know, thinking about how I'm going to really respond to some of the things I've mentioned. There. And then I went back to have very, very active reading the second time. Then I started to group the, the, the work into yeah. easy and difficult. And then I left everything again for a couple of days. I started thinking about, you know, the easy and difficult. Hey, one thing I found very, very interesting is, you know, with the easy ones, whenever I found the answer for the easy one, I get very excited and say, oh, I can get through this, at least I've, done, I've got answer for this one, you know, and it was really, really helpful, you know, to group, you know, the responses into easy, easy and difficult ones. And then with the difficult task, now, this is something that may be useful for early career researchers. Always, always have your network with you. So this might be your supervisors, this might be, you know, yeah. maybe, you know, critical friends, but they will have to be senior people really senior people. So with the difficult comments, I actually went to my to my supervisors uh, for those comments and said, well, Ian, Bobby, what do you think about this you know, argument that I've been set out here? I think this is way beyond me. I don't think I'll be able to really address some of the things that we're that are saying here. And you know, bless Ian. Ian has a way of addressing things. You know, the first thing you would just forget about your fears. There's nothing big about what they're asking you. Get Get on with it, he will say. <laughs> <laughs> he will say to me, say, Bobby, get on with it. Don't, don't, don't mess about with this thing. So although, yeah, it was very direct, but at the same time, it gave me answers to those mm -hmm. difficult, you know, questions. And then in my responses to the, to the reviewers, the first thing I will often do is first acknowledge their possible positive comments. You know, I, I really, really find that very, very helpful, all the positive comments that you should start with. They, there are really some sort of encouragement, you know, for me to actually go and do what they're asking me, you know, to, it's like you give a treat to, to, to a pair, obviously, they'll be happy to go for work, you know. <laughs> so I find it very, very helpful. Uh, so I often acknowledge their positive comment, how helpful actually that has been to, uh, for me to actually go on about to do, uh, to make some changes to, to, the, to the work. And where possible, often I like the changes I make to the paper. This is very, very interesting because you cannot do everything uh, you know, reviewers have asked you to do. It's, it's impossible. It's only 8,000 words. You've got sometimes less than 8,000 words. So it's almost impossible to actually chuck everything in there. And also, always add this at the back of your mind that you know exactly what the picture you're trying to paint mm -hmm. with this work. And by going too far away from that picture, your message will be lost. You know, the, the point of looking at the editor's, um, the reviewer's comments is mainly to help you, you know, to straighten your argument, make it watertight, make sure that, I mean, nothing will fall apart if you actually put it against the wall. So I try to highlight some of the changes that I've actually, you know, that I made in those things. Sometimes I actually sign posts. Some of the things that I cannot unpack. I try to signpost them with yeah. references. You know, just reference one or two works and say, okay, there are further information that could be fine, especially historical context. You know, you cannot, I mean, you could say the whole 8,000 word in historical context yeah. on its own. So I, I try to signpost using, you know, references um, uh, in that way. But even with all that, and this is another thing probably that helped me through, with all that, I still had a very low expectation in terms of acceptance uh, of this paper. Because, I mean, uh, before I actually went into submitting the paper to surgical review, I was looking at, you know, their acceptance, you know, level. I think it's only 40% of the paper submitted, you know, to the journal. So it, it's a really, really tight, you know, hole to get through, you know, with your, with your papers. So um, 
I, that really keeping a very open mind and having very low expectation also of our symptoms really, really, you know, helped me to get through uh, some of the things. But more than that, like I said before, looking at things from very two ways, easy and difficult task, and then having my network with, with me, it, it really, really crucial to have, you know, these people, this, again, senior people that really helped me to look at some of those things. I, I think I mentioned at the beginning, this was actually at the period, it was a different time of my PhD. So <laughs> it, I was already punching above my weight. I, I feel, I felt like that, you know, going to surgical review, you know, you know in between the PhD, I think, I need that at the start of the whole process. I look at the papers and who's actually published in there. There are people way above me. So going to submit a paper there all by myself, of course, wasn't, wasn't possible. So there were a lot of people behind the scene of the paper that we're actually talking about here that probably we didn't see. We just have, you know, that's on top of comments from, uh, mm -hmm. from, from the reviewer. So having this, you know, um, this support uh, was, was really, really good. Again. Yeah with Michaela as well, you know, setting out, you know, making it very clear how to go about, you know, some of these comments exactly. uh, was, was really helpful. That's that's really, really helpful. Thank you. And I, and I think you're being incredibly modest, modest by saying you're punching above your weight because you clearly weren't because you clearly belonged, you know, in the publication belonged. And I also think, you know, I think this idea of getting help from people is not, should not be confined to early career. Um, certainly early career colleagues should um, get help, but I think we all do it. And have people mm -hmm. read our work. Um, your 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 school or your department may actually have a system for doing that already, a, a reading group or something. But if not, there may be a research center or a trusted colleague. And it's really good idea to have someone else put their eyes over it. I also think it's a good idea. It's a really good idea to take your time with the feedback oh. because sometimes, and particularly if you're early career, but or even you know. I'm very much not early career now, um, um, but still getting feedback can be quite difficult, you know, because you want it to go well. And if it hasn't, it can be a bit, you feel a bit bruised, perhaps um, frustrated with yourself for not having landed it. And I think it's worth taking a little bit of time to just kind of think about the, the, the feedback and actually look for the positive, because often what we do is we cling to the one negative comment or the criticism, and that's all you can think about. But actually, it's probably one small part of a much broader kind of positive thing. So do do kind of be thinking about that. And getting someone else to read the feedback is also a really useful thing if you're feeling a little bit like Ooh, that didn't go well, because they can help you sort through it. So that's that's so helpful. Thank you. Um, Kirstine, should we, should we go back to um, Michaela now just to, to round yeah. off? So I essentially kind of wanted to put that type of question um, to, to Michaela because it's I, I mentioned before, like we act as a bridge, you know, because I sometimes feel as an editor, I'm very conscious of how those reviews can be received. And even if I know the reviews are a good set of reviews, when they've got a lot of comments <laughs> on them, it can feel like a lot, you know, and I'm keen that I'll comment um, in in my kind of uh, in my comments back to the author. This is a this is a constructive set of reviews. This is a good set of reviews, like read across them. and. And kind of guide them. So I wanted to hear um, from your perspective, Michaela, about um, that kind of aspect of the, re the review process, what your expectations are for authors and what advice as well you would give authors in receiving that feedback. Yeah, that's a really good question, Kirstine, and it <clears throat> gives me an opportunity to also just um, in defense of reviewers um, to say that I think we all know uh, from our own experiences of reviewing that quite often writing a review is something that takes place outside of normal hours and under quite constrained circumstances. So there's not necessarily that, they can be quite raw, let's put it that way, um, in terms of you know providing, providing feedback. Now, I think that that makes it even more important as editors that we decode those for authors. And so one of the things that I, um, would do as you know, as you've already kind of described there, Kirsteen, is I'd, I'd read across them and think, okay, well, what are this? What, what? Where do these converge? Very often they look as though they diverge, and and then you then you read them carefully, and you're like, well, actually, no, you know, actually, all of these people are pointing to some issues around structure. All of these people are pointing to some some issue around this theoretical or conceptual agenda. Whether it's that they don't understand it, which might just mean that the author needs to make it more clear 
or whether it's that they disagree. So really trying to tease out and pull those apart, thinking about the, you know, the various different dimensions of a paper. And I think that the role for the editor there is really clear. We actually have the editorial distance to be able to read those reviews and to kind of package them, repackage them to help the author to develop their paper. So drawing out those key points that need to be addressed there. And I think that my advice to um, reviewers, I mean, this is what will happen if you submit a paper to the sociological review. I mean, this is what the editors at the sociological review do. That is our practice. Um, we've been developing that over a long period of time. Um, but I think that what can happen, I think even then is because quite often you, what you want to do in that editorial review is indicate the level of revision that's required. And I'm not talking minor, major. It's very, very common for people to get major revisions. This is probably mm. the most common revision um, category that we give. And this might be because there's substantial work to be done. So the editor may be writing to you to say, you need to do significant and substantial revisions here. This is not additive work. This is work which requires you to go back and to rethink all of the different elements of the paper and what they bring to the argument that you're making. And I think that can be very, very challenging. But the reason that we approach it that way is partly because that's what the reviews will show up. That's what it shows up when you're an editor. But I would take it and, you know, having benefited from processes like this over the course of my career, where, they, where these revisions are constructively presented, let's put it that way, because quite often the least constructive reviews don't actually even offer any suggestion about what you could do. They just say, this is rubbish. This is, you know, this doesn't happen at the sociological review, though, by the way, just to be very, very clear, I'm talking about past personal experiences. Um, that's, that is what the project is. The project there is about the editors and the reviewers working together with the author, albeit in this rather strange kind of environment, to really draw out the potential of the paper and to really make the paper as good as it can be. And so that's why we might suggest doing significant revisions. And I just wanted to pick up on one last thing if I could. One of the most common pieces of uh, response that we get from authors is I can't possibly do this within 8,000 words. Okay, so that is, that's, that's a common response. What we did at the Sociological Review to address that, we did, we did a couple of things. The first is we unhooked, unhinged the list of references from the 8,000 words. And we did that because we were con concerned about practices of citation, because that's the first thing that disappears when people are asked to do major work on a paper. So that's the first thing to say. But the other thing is that actually quite often as an editor, you look at something and you know that something could be substantially edited from the point of view of how it's written to bring it into those 8,000 words because there are redundant sentences or you're using the wrong tense or something like that. Now, of course, these are all the elements of the review of, of writing that get squeezed given the constraints that we have. And I've seen that there are some comments in the chat around timing and you know, all of these kinds of things are in different types of pressures. But one of the things that I noticed over my tenure as editor, and this, this kind of goes to the heart of some of the things that Karen and both, both Karen and Balaji were saying around, you know, sharing your work with people and letting it take its time. I think quite often as editors, we see things before they have been um, sent around those networks, because for whatever reason, people don't feel that they can send them to their colleagues mm -hmm. to share, that they don't feel that they can get their feedback. And I think that this is particularly important when it comes to working with ECR texts, um, partly because it's their first experience of the process, but recognizing that people might not necessarily have had the right networks, which is always possible um, in order to accommodate and facilitate that or the experiences, or they just don't know that, you know, really that's the role of a mentor, that's the role of a former supervisor or, or somebody like that. So, so I think that, that that's something that's worth making visible, that not everybody has that access. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and they need, to, you know, somehow we need to make visible that that is what's helping with the development of some papers. Look, I think that's really important to emphasize and also to make aware to anyone as well that's an early career researcher there, that that's something that we're very mindful of 
uh, the sociological review and how we approach papers that come from from early career researchers. And I, I think you're absolutely right. You can tell papers that just haven't had the benefit of that network. Um, and it's about trying to balance that, isn't it? Like with the with the work we do. Yeah. I just could I just come in? There's a, there's another thing that I see quite a lot of. Um, there seems to be a concern within the academic community that by sharing work too early, people steal your work. And I know that this is something that's also feeding into some of that reluctance to share. And I, I, I think it's really kind of important to think about trust within those networks and within those settings. And obviously Balaji's described these networks where he's developed trust with people yeah. um, around those issues. But, but that's an, it's, it's not an issue that, I mean, it definitely happens sometimes, but I think it's another thing that we have to be very, very critically aware of as, as editors, as reviewers, as authors, um, that people have that fear that somebody's going to steal mm -hmm. their, their original idea that they've spent a lot of time working on. So I just wanted to just, I wanted to throw that in there. I don't have a solution, but I wanted to throw it in. Yeah. No, it's it's an important context as well. And I think maybe it might come up with one of the first questions, which I'm assuming, Karen, are we moving on to? Yeah, I think we probably should. Point? Yeah. Um, well, well, I just kind of uh, follow on that is it, it's in part been covered, uh, but I think there's a little bit to pull out that follows on from that question it was from Carly and the, one of the first questions in the chat. Hi, Carly. So uh, building on that um, about um, taking more uh, difficult peer review comments to some more senior, Carly was asking when doing this, um, should these people be someone who has an understanding of the field of research? And are there any tips about building networks? That, just building on as well what you were saying there, Michaela. Do you want me to come in with yeah. my two pennies worth? Um, <laughs> uh, go ahead. Um, Wait, go ahead. I'll, I'll come out. Oh. <laughs> so I would say I think it depends on which journal you're submitting to, Carly, because I think that when it comes to something like the sociological review, the ambitions are to have significance towards a general sociological audience. And so actually it might not necessarily be the people who are like the top people in your field um, necessarily. You might, you might want people to look at it who don't have that understanding, um, but you might also want a combination if you can. So two or three people coming at it with different experiences. Um, but I'll pass over to Balaji to add his thoughts. Yeah, thanks very much for that. I think in my case, drawing from my own example, I mean, I remember when I was actually doing my PhD, I usually have, of course, my supervisors. I think I was lucky to have three people. And also I have actually, it was just like, uh, we also PhD students around the same time, so two years above me. So anything that I didn't get from my supervisors, I probably would get from this my colleague who's almost close to me. So it gives you really very, you know, round, you know, you know, comment or feedback, you know, about your work. But something I found more helpful was speaking to my supervisor about it because these are the people that actually know a lot about my work. They know the field. They know where this paper is actually, you know, uh, where the paper was going. In some cases, some of them may even recognize some of the comments and may know who's actually being the, review, the, the reviewer. So they have really good insight. Uh, I love it. I mean, again, some of the, um, like Ian Law, it was really published widely. You know, I've been so lucky to have this kind of mentorship of him. So when you get comments of them, of course, they don't know it all. But the kind of guidance that they provided me with really helped me to actually shift. Uh, some of my arguments, some of my responses to, to the reviewer. But what I will say generally is um, you don't really have to, you know, have somebody who knows the field. Sometimes, you know, there are two ways. I mean, Michaela mentioned this, you know, you need somebody from the complete outside the field. You know, somebody who can just read, just they want to tell you, this actually reads well, this actually flows well. I learned quite a lot from this. Again, looking at logical review, where quite a lot of different works are actually well, published in logical review. So you don't really have to tie yourself to that somebody who is actually within you know, the field. It could be you know, somebody who can just say, you know what, I really like the way you've actually you know, make your argument very clearly. You know the kind of comment you're going to be getting from this person and say, okay, 
Well, I appreciate this. At least one problem is eliminated. This is actually neatly written. I need to go to somebody else for maybe more critical, more contextualized, you know, criticism. So you need to, one way or the other, build your network, general, you know, from places to places. But a good starting point is if you are within an institution, you have a, a mentor or you have a supervisor, uh, they are usually, well, I hope if you have a good relationship with them, they are usually the best, you know, starting point going forward. Can I just so quickly add one comment to uh, what actually uh, Karen mentioned about it, uh, taking time with the, with the review. Uh, rather than just adding a comment, let me just mention one or two things that I did wrong by not taking time, you know, because my review could have been shorter, if Michaela could probably recollect, but because I got so excited, I responded so quickly at some point, which I shouldn't have, and that really pushed the review you know, further you know, down the line. It shouldn't have been. Um, so I, I remember after having after meeting uh, Michaela in, in Manchester, then you know, I felt like, oh God, I think I have so many resources, interesting stuff to go back. You know, I went back and I do, 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 write everything, and I send it back, and then she said, oh, okay, you should have taken your time with it. So, in, in, in that context, always try, even when you think you've got all the resources needed, it's never be enough to take your time. Because what I realize is, you know, if I'm reading one paper now, in the next two, three weeks, the view I will take with the same paper will be completely different. So taking the time to actually shape the argument neatly, and the longer it actually takes, you know, it, the, the better it actually comes out uh, in, in the end. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, you know, in terms of building, like, I think supervisors are a great place to start. Um, but also, if you're early career, you may be like now away from your supervisors, um, you know, and I think it's looking in your looking in your department or, or your school for, um, like I said before, maybe um, research centers that may have, you know, may have sort of reading groups where you could do a kind of work in progress consultation with them. Um, and, and something like that might be a good way to get to get feedback from peers and from, you know, from your immediate early career peers and also from more senior um, colleagues together. I'm just going to move on to another question from Lily. Um, so Lily, this is a good question. Lily asks, how do you know what comments to keep, internalize, amend and what comments uh, may not be applicable to the picture that you're painting? So it's that you've got all of this advice, you've got this you know, there's, how do you make, how do you make that choice um, when you kind of decide, no, this, I'm keeping this, this is what I want to say. Um, how does that, Bolaji, do you want to say something about that? Yeah. So I uh, remember before I mentioned uh, grouping those comments into easy and difficult ones. So within the easy ones, quickly, you can say, you know, well, I found this very interesting. This would be easy for me to actually tackle. I will go out with this. The difficult bit, you have to look at those difficult comments in two ways. Like, okay, do they really speak directly to what you're trying to do here? If they do, then try and adjust you know, and address them as you know, tight, as really short as possible. Um, if they don't, you don't have to really address everything. You probably cannot address everything. So for example, uh, in my own case, I knew the picture I wanted to paint. And what I was actually looking for in, in reviews, been, okay, what can I add to this picture that will make it more beautiful, that will make it more interesting, that will make it argument more tighter. And it will be easy for you because you are the one that owns this picture. You are the artist, yeah. If you find any color that doesn't really suit your painting, you're not gonna have it. Now, the downside to that would be when you send it back to, uh, to, the, to the journal and the editor picks it up and says, okay, Maybe this bit that you left out uh, could have been helpful in unpacking argument a lot more. Then you can now pick it up and just you know add it back on. But uh, in terms of what you had and what you reject, it's it's quite obvious to individuals. No, I, I knew what I was trying to paint anyway while I was building up. So uh, it was easy for me to actually remove some of the things. So for example, I knew my argument is always centered around you know, blackness and racialization, the experience of people of color in Poland. And some of the comments I got was a bit distracting to what about the experience of, you know, uh, say, Polish people in Ireland or in the UK. And I welcome that, you know, in my response, I, I welcome it. It's almost very 
interesting, you know, similar argument that we can really draw on in terms of you know, racialization and exclusion. However, this paper is really based on you know, the experience of people of color, which we don't have enough experience about. So I really need this space here to unpack these people you know, uh, experiences more mm. than just all that have been done as well. So those are the ways actually to go about because I know also in the comments, it's quite easy to get distracted and being taken around. And uh, bless him, he's always saying, Bobby, don't let anyone take you to pop and you get drunk, you get, you know, <laughs> get out of the what you really wanted to do. Always remember to come back to your main argument. You know what you wanted to build and you can draw from some of the things that they're going to tell you, which is good. The ones that you cannot, you'll be able to tell, obviously, yeah. from your thinking. That's great. Thank you. Mikaela, uh, Mik uh, do you want to come in? Yeah, and I think this will help with some of the other comments for the uh, questions below around the response to reviewers. I think the important thing to say is in, in cases where we get articles which have got, you know, um, major revisions, we call it, we don't have revise and re we very rarely use revise and resubmit, which is a, a, a really uh, different type of category. But one of the most common problems with them is actually that they've overstretched their argument. And I think that this is really important. So, so what happens is then the reviewers pick up that they're not convinced about the contribution. And they highlight instead other possibilities for refining that contribution and refining that argument. So they, make, they can make suggestions. Sometimes they're a little bit more than suggestions. Sometimes they say, you should do this. I, I mean, you, you kind of have to pick between those things. But I found that in the cases where re reviewers have, have addressed this quite directly and where as an editor, I've read across those and thought, okay, well, actually they've got a point there around this, that that's really helped the authors ultimately to make a decision about which, which comments they should respond to and which ones they shouldn't. Because if you're making a decision about something as big as your contribution, then necessarily that is going to change the argument that you're presenting and change what information needs to be there to support it. Now, how you address this as an author is in the response to reviewers, which we haven't really commented on today. Um, and you would go in and you would describe in the opening section, you know, the overall work that you've done, the big work that you've done on it. And you may then say, and this means that I haven't addressed, you know, I, I, well, not that I haven't, but this means that, you know, the comments raised by reviewer one and three about this are no longer relevant because those sections are no longer included there, or that's no longer a critical mm -hmm. part of my argument. Um, where it comes to, I think where it gets a bit more tricky is when there's been a difference of opinion around something like the theoretical framing of an argument but you're perfectly within your rights to say, you know, I'm very well aware of this body of work. This body of work doesn't speak to the argument that I'm trying to make because of X, Y, and Z. But you may want to put a short comment in the text that actually says that. Because if mm -hmm. one reviewer has picked it up, somebody else reading it will also likely pick it up. So you can say, I've addressed this, but you, you know, so there are various ways of, um, uh, of approaching it. Yeah, I think I think that's really helpful about and that is partly a confidence thing, isn't it, to be able to say, no, I'm doing this, not this. And that is something that you can get a bit, if you're early career or if you're not early career, if you're much kind of uh, much more established and you're not sure how to, you know, that's something you can get advice on. Do you think it's OK to, like, you know, draw the line here and, and not do it? So I think that very much answers. Hopefully that answers Elisa's comment uh, further down as well about how to communicate that. You know, in that letter, you don't have to say that you've done everything. You can say why you've not done. All I'm when I'm editing as an editor, what I'm looking for in that letter is a rationale for what's been done. Yeah. So to, to tell me what's been done, not that I don't expect you to tick every box, but I expect you to kind of account for the decisions you've made based on the, the feedback that you ha have had. So I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Christine, do you want to dig out a question? I do. I mean, and just as well, I'm doing that as well, just to come in as well. I think it's really important that authors know that reviews and what the editor's expectations are not something that's absolutely a prescriptive, slavish response to all of the comments. You know, it is. it, it does respect your... Um, your own original contribution and, and your authority as an author on that paper to respond with authority to those reviews as well, as well as being open to the to the uh, comments and, and, and criticisms that's finding that balance. So um, 
I mean, there's more questions here that um, we have in relation to the, the specifics around um, how long it should take to respond to, to comments. Now, um, I don't know if that's actually something that we can, maybe Mika can come in on as well in terms of first, the timeframes that you have, mm, because I think also working with the timeframes and what you have is a good way to kind of think how you might break that down. Yeah, um, so, so strictly speaking, if you get asked to make revisions, I'm trying to remember what the rules are, but is it three months? I can't I think remember. It is. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it says three months in the letter um, to make major revisions. Um, and I think that um, it kind of, it really does depend on whether they're big concerns or they're small concerns, really, as to how you, how long it takes to deal with the comments. The thing that I always used to raise an eyebrow about was when I'd sent major revisions to people and I got their revised version two days later. Mm. That always really, mm. you know, obviously people are in really different situations uh, and some people might be full time on research, but, but actually that always used to worry me a little bit about whether they'd actually taken the reviewer comments seriously or whether they were engaging with it in a, in a different way. Um, so I think that you take the time it takes. Um, sometimes that can exceed the three month limit, again, depending on how, how long, um, how much time you have to dedicate to it. And I should say, you know, while we don't have a standard process for extending the review time, um, you can always ask the um, journal manager if they would, they would extend your revision time. So I think, it, again, it depends. Sorry, it's not a precise answer because it's completely impossible to give a precise yeah, exactly. answer. And I've, I mean, I found myself with minor revisions that end up me turning them into major revisions and taking, <laughs> you know, weeks longer than it should do to, to do those. But then, I, but then, as Bobby says, I'm always really, really happy with the outcome when I've done that um, because I know it's made a better paper. But of course, you have to work with what's going to work for you as well in terms of timing. So, so I think that's that's what I would say about it. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. I'm really aware of the time. I think we could keep talking for, for quite a long time on this because it's such an important issue, but we are going to have to stop now. I know we haven't answered all of the questions specifically. If anyone does have a kind of question, that you, you know, you're welcome to contact um, any of us, you know, to, to ask that question or um, go onto the Twitter feed and post the question there, because I'd imagine there's lots of people that have got the same question. Um, if you've still got that concern and we, and we can engage with some of those discussions there and draw on other people's experiences. Um, but for now, I think we're going to have to draw this to a, a close. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, in particular, um, thank you to our, to our two um, guests, Balaji Balagun and um, Michaela Benson. And thank you to Kirstine as well. And to Karen Shook, who's just had to leave, but has been doing all of the magic behind the, the yes. scenes in terms of managing it, managing, managing it technologically, which you really don't want me doing. Um, so that, that was really great. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, you know, do, do when it comes out, you know, do circulate it on Twitter. I'm, I'm sure lots of people will be interested. And uh, we hope that from the sociological review, you some of you will consider um, submitting articles to us when when you have them and they're ready and so that you can engage with this with process and we look forward to working with you thank you very much everybody absolutely thank you thank you karen thanks bye Amanda. bye